Uh, please, anybody, again, if you didn't get a hang on, Sarah's coming in, so let me bring her in. Um, if I haven't authorized you for recording and you would like to do that, please just shoot me a quick chat and I will make sure to do so. So thank you again. So we'll get going and we'll, um, so we can answer your questions. So thank you so much for joining us today for our media briefing. Today, we are going to feature an infectious disease specialist from UNC Health, UNC School of Medicine, uh, who you have spoken with uh, in the past. And uh, he is leading the efforts to help test and treat COVID-19 patients. And so um, we'll, there'll be a number of areas that he can address, uh, especially with the things that are going on in the news today. Logistically, just to let you know, again, um, we will be recording audio and video and we'll make those available as soon as the call is over. Um, those will be posted uh, on Dropbox. I'll send everybody a link for the video and, and the separate audio files. Um, and those are, as always, will be unedited. So you can use those and uh, have confidence in them. So at this point, I will turn it over to my colleague, Alan Wolf, and Alan will introduce our guest expert. Alan? Thanks, Phil. Good morning, Dr. Wall. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, Dr. David Wall is a professor of medicine and, and an infectious disease expert at UNC Health and UNC School of Medicine. He um, is wearing many hats these days, and we appreciate him taking the time. Um, he leads the Respiratory Diagnostic Center at UNC Medical Center in Chapel Hill that is testing hundreds of patients a day for COVID-19. He's also overseeing testing efforts in underserved communities, including in uh, Lee County and elsewhere. And he also helps treat COVID-19 patients. He's also the principal investigator of the ACTIVE-2 clinical trial that's evaluating several promising treatments for COVID-19. And um, he's, um, before all this began, his research also focused on serious viral infections, including HIV, Ebola, and loss of fever in West Africa. Dr. Wall, do you want to um, kick things off and maybe just talk a little bit about how, how far we've come since March and, and where things are now? Yes, thank you. And thanks, everyone, for being on this call. I'm glad that we have a good turnout. I think the events over the last week have really stressed the need for us to um, move the needle and try to find treatments that are effective for people who are becoming progressively more ill with COVID-19. So I, I think the attention that's now being paid to treatment uh, is appropriate uh, and deserved. We've been spending a lot of time appropriately thinking about vaccines, um, but I do think having the conversation also include treatment is incredibly important. So I'm able to answer, the introduction kind of gave you some of the hats that I'm wearing, and hopefully I can provide a little bit of background about therapeutics, where we are, why that's so important, um, and what we can expect, and, and even some of the candidate therapies. There's news even this morning of uh, developments in the field, uh, and even um, plans for there to be more therapeutics available to treat people, not only in the hospital, but also outside the hospital. I think we can open it up to media questions. I'm guessing lots of folks want to ask you things. Uh, anyone want to step up first? Hope so. Yeah, I'll go ahead and ask a question. Um, hey, it's Al from 97.9 The Hill. Um, I'm kind of wondering if you could expand a little bit about what we know with how President Trump is currently being treated. And I saw that you were also using some of the kind of trial treatments that he is kind of using excuse if I butcher it, Dexam, dexamethasone. Um, if you could talk about kind of what you've seen with your work um, using that drug in patients here and maybe how realistically you're expecting President Trump to be responding to those drugs. <clears throat> Thanks, Al. I, I think those are really important questions. To clarify and just as sort of a background or basis for our conversation, the president, as we've been told, has been treated with three different therapeutics that we're, that we're aware of. Uh, one is remdesivir. It's an antiviral drug. It's administered intravenously uh, for five days. Uh, and there's clinical trial data that support its use in people who have severe COVID-19. And so he, he certainly um, received that. He's got his last dose, I believe, yesterday in the White House. 
Um, and again, it's administered IV. We use this all the time. It's standard of care here and across the US. In addition, he got dexamethasone, and dexamethasone is reserved for some of the sickest patients. Those are individuals who we really feel can benefit from an anti-inflammatory drug, because dexamethasone has been around for a very long time, since the 50s, and calms down the immune system's response to COVID-19. And so we see when there's an exuberant immune response, especially in the lungs, people have a harder time breathing, that could make them deteriorate. So calming that down, even though it suppresses the immune system to fight the virus, seems to be worth it. And we have great clinical trial data from the UK that indicate that this can be really important and life-saving. The experimental therapy that the president received is the Regeneron cocktail of monoclonal antibodies. So this is really important because this is a class of drugs. It's not just one particular agent. And so monoclonal antibodies are copies of antibodies that survivors of an infection have made and that in the lab look really good at neutralizing the pathogen. So we've seen this for Ebola, we're studying this for HIV, and here for SARS-CoV-2, some people make great antibodies against the virus. We've been able to copy that in the lab and administer it to people. So there's two different antibodies in the cocktail that the president received from Regeneron. They both target different parts of the same protein on the virus surface that allows the virus to enter into cells. So again, that's experimental. It's being studied in a variety of clinical trials. I'm told by the company that some people have received this through compassionate use, but just a handful of people in the past. And I suppose just a quick follow-up about the, uh, thankfully I got some background in a prior story about what monoclonal antibodies were because I was sadly quite uninformed, but I feel like we haven't had a very large call to action to receive you know, plasma to get these antibodies and potentially see if any other COVID survivors might have generated their own specific set of antibodies. Um, can you maybe expand on why that is? Is it just that we've maybe found, you know, like you said, two choice antibodies that seem to work or we're not wanting to get people's hopes up? Yeah, so it's a really important question about plasma. So again, Regeneron is making this product available to the president. There are other products. Lilly is, um, has a, an antibody, a monoclonal antibody. Uh, it's one antibody right now, but they're looking at combinations uh, that also target similar parts of the virus and uh, again, prevent it from entering into a cell. Um, and then there's others. So there's different companies that are working on these monoclonals. They all basically have the same sort of idea. Um, and so plasma is what we've been using up until now and what we're still using uh, commonly across the US and in Europe. Plasma is a little bit more of a roll of the dice because you don't know what antibodies any one individual might make. Maybe they'll make a good antibody. Maybe they'll make a really super great antibody. Will they make it in enough quantity? So this takes some of the guesswork out of um, giving somebody a therapeutic that's designed to use an antibody against the virus. With plasma, you really can't tell. We're doing a study here looking at plasma with high titers of neutralizing antibody versus lower titers of neutralizing antibody. Nobody does it. You know, nobody gets nothing. Everyone gets plasma. Uh, and that is a way that we can understand whether or not quantity as well as quality makes a difference. Monoclonal antibodies jump to the next step, which say, we know that these antibodies in the lab work really, really well. It takes the guesswork out of, well, does the plasma have the right antibodies or not? It says, let's target the virus, designing antibodies that can do that in a laboratory and give it to people to see if it works. So far, I have to say from the press releases that we've gotten from Regeneron and from Lilly, it does seem to have an antiviral effect. And even in early phase studies, there's a suggestion of clinical benefit vis-a-vis -vis decreasing medical visits, ER visits, hospitalization. Great. Um, so anyone else have a, a question from the media? Please just jump right in and ask Dr. Wall. I do. This is Sarah Vasca um, from Cardinal and Pine. I hope you're doing well. Can you talk at all about any concerns that you might have as a physician in kind of the way this virus has been treated by President Trump and, and others kind of in recent days and downplaying it and kind of what, if any kind of concerns you have about how this is resonating in the public health 
realm? I think with the president and his uh, inner circle and a widening circle now um, being diagnosed uh, with um, SARS-CoV-2 infection, I think there's an opportunity. And the opportunity is there to send messages that this is a very serious infection. Um, it in included um, the hospitalization of our president at Walter Reed and some intensive efforts to make sure that he did not become sicker. So I think, again, there is a conversation that could be had about the seriousness of this infection uh, and about the measures that could be taken to prevent it. I think, unfortunately, that opportunity was missed. And instead, uh, what we see is, um, uh, instead we see filled in is some posturing um, regarding domination, um, regarding um, not letting the virus beat you in sort of an upbeat approach that I think we've seen before as this pandemic has been handled by this administration. And, and I think that that's unfortunate. I, I think right now we have to really take seriously this virus. It is expanding um, in many parts of the country, not receding. We've lost you know, 210,000 people, as we all know, maybe more because of undercounting of the number of people who've died due to COVID-19. So it's very frustrating as someone who's a treating physician and who wears sometimes a small public health hat to not see messaging to take this more seriously. It was also disconcerting to me that the president says that now he's learned a lot about coronavirus um, and again, it, it's, it's, it smacks a little bit of this um, selfishness of I learned about it because I got infected, not because of my fellow Americans getting infected. So yes, I think as a physician, as someone who's public health minded, I see this as a missed opportunity and it is very frustrating, I think, for most anyone who's involved in this field not to see modeling of behaviors that are productive and not counterproductive, including wearing masks. Mask wearing is really, really important. Um, and any of us who's been on a plane or who's been in a crowded area outside or inside knows masks are important. Yet the disdain that's being still shown even after um, infection is running throughout the White House for masks is just perplexing to me. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, who else would like to ask a question from the media? Please just jump right in. I have a question. This oh. is Judith. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, uh, this is Judith with WNCN. You know, the, it sounds like the, the president had some pretty extensive treatment to this. For the average person, is is what is this, his treatment the reality for what most COVID nineteen patients go through in this country? You know, the good thing is that a lot of people who have COVID-19 do fine all by themselves. The problem is we don't really have a good sorting hat that tells us who's going to do well and who doesn't. That's the problem. While there are some risk factors that can point in the direction that somebody may be more likely to be hospitalized or end up on a ventilator or even die, they're very imperfect. And so we've seen young people die and we've seen older people survive easily from COVID-19. So it's that Russian roulette, if you will, nature of this that is so scary um, and, and why we should be afraid of this virus because it is not innocuous, um, it is not the flu, and it's not just a common cold. So yes, I think that the president um, received a very aggressive course of medicines. Two of the three are readily available to people right now. So if someone is hospitalized, um, they could get remdesivir if they require oxygen. If somebody is progressing um, and needs even more oxygen, Oftentimes we use dexamethasone. So these are standard. Again, the aspect of his treatment that's not standard is the experimental use of monoclonal antibodies. And while we've seen some good signals for that, we really need to study these. At UNC and across the country, we are studying monoclonal antibodies in early treatment of COVID-19, specifically outpatients, because that's where you really want to use a therapeutic. By the time someone ends up in the hospital, you're rescuing them. What I really want to do is be able to help us find a treatment that prevents people from needing hospitalization, maybe even decreases their shedding of the virus to other people. So we have a wonderful study that Operation Warp Speed is funding, is sponsoring called Active2. If you go to www.riseabovecovid.org, 
you could find out all you want about this really important study that's open nationwide and soon will go international. And what's nice about the study is we're looking at all different types of therapeutics. It's a platform for studying monoclonals. It could study antivirals. It could study inhaled medicines. So any promising medicine that passes the SNF test could enter this clinical trial and we can compare those to see which are the best. So I think that's really important. And I, again, I think that we've seen in the past some short changing of some of the research ideas because of some of the strongly held beliefs of people. Hydroxychloroquine is an example where it's become very hard to study that medication because of the firm beliefs that have been entrenched on different sides of the political spectrum about its effectiveness in the absence of really good clinical data. So we really do need good clinical trials to find out what works and what doesn't work. Will Michaels, I think you had a question next. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Wallace. Will Michaels at WUNC. Um, I just had, based on some, some questions about general trends based on where we are at this point in time, because I noticed that the number of new positive cases each day has been increasing in North Carolina over the past three weeks or so. The percent positive has also seemed to go up in that about that amount of time. Um, uh, where, what's your impression, one, of kind of where we are with trends uh, along with North Carolina opening up into phase three? And how are you all going to manage flu season? Are you going to swab everyone for both COVID and the flu? Yeah, really good question, Will. You know, all of us are concerned about the trends. You have to really be in denial not to be concerned about where we are, not only in our state, but in our country, looking at the number of cases that we're still seeing. And while we've seen some declines in death, likely due to the shift of a younger population becoming infected with more reopening and more mixing, I think it's still very concerning. Um, so we're still seeing people die, uh, as you know, um, and I see it you know, every time I'm working in the hospital and in the intensive care unit, we see people die. So people die. Uh, so I agree. I think that this is a, a trend that's still not in the right direction, far from it. Um, many other places, and you can argue every place is different, whether it be size or structure of the government or funding or whatever. Um, but there are other places where they had a very big surge, a peak, and now have seen really low levels of continued infection. Some of those places are now seeing a, a resurgence as they reopen up. And that's a warning to us who've been slow to reopen and slow to close. Uh, so I, I think we have to really take a lesson from some other parts of the world uh, about what works and doesn't work. Again, to any casual observer, the more that we reopen, the more that we um, don't use the measures that we know works, the more infections we see. So to keep safe, you know, we need to wear masks, but yet we have a huge proportion of Americans who are not wearing masks. Again, encouraged somewhat by this administration, by our president, who very well may be a super spreader. You know, it means social distancing, yet again, we've seen calls for um, not having social distancing in place and opening up bars and restaurants and other, in schools where kids are, are grouped together. So I think that, again, we're sending um, mixed messages. We want to see the pandemic go away, but at the same time, we're not taking the really tough measures we need to, and difficult measures. I get it. There's a lot of sacrifice involved here to save people's lives, but I think that's what we should be doing. Great. Uh, next question from the media. Just jump in. Hi, this is Lynn Bonner from the News and Observer. Can you give an update on the uh, Moderna phase three trial? Um, how many are, are enrolled at UNC and, and I guess what, what the status is? Yeah, and no, I'm glad you brought up vaccine trials. You know, I, I feel very strongly about this. Um, you know, the research, just to, to be clear, I think the researchers and the scientists are doing a fantastic job under very extraordinary circumstances. Clinical trials, including the vaccine trials, have been stood up in incredible amount of time. I mean, really, to be able to, to condense, um, and it's not because of cutting corners. It's because people are working hard, you know, seven days a week, you know, long hours to design these things, implement them. So being firsthand on the front lines of the clinical research, I can tell you, 
we are doing this extremely rigorously. That is not the problem. The studies are designed well. I think that we will get answers eventually. Um, the issue is people interpreting preliminary data too soon and to make inferences from those data that can then lead to changes in care and policy. So that's where I think the danger comes. The Moderna trial is a very good example. Here's a novel vaccine that was developed, tested in phase one and looked very safe. We saw antibodies being developed to people who got it. That's great. That justifies its moving on to the next phases. And so we've enrolled 150 people as of today, maybe a little bit more by the end of today, hoping to hit almost 200. Um, other centers have enrolled even more. We're seeking really to make sure that we're inclusive, that we can reach out to people who are most impacted by COVID-19 and who are bearing disproportionately in, in an unequal way uh, the brunt of this pandemic. Um, and so we've really tried hard to make sure that that's, that's a paramount importance to us. So the, the trial keeps going. Um, I think we'll have good data from this and subsequent trials and hopefully a vaccine that could be shown to be effective, you know, come early to mid next year. Great. Um, we'll take I'm wondering, I'm sorry, I'm wondering if you could speak to this as well. Um, you know, there's the vaccine has been politicized and the de development of the vac vaccine has been politicized and i've seen polls that say that people will be won't take it yeah. um for you know for whatever reason and there's been this question about whether there are um there is going to be less rigor um involved yeah. for political reasons so can you speak to that i mean is there any assurance that you know, vaccines um, that are eventually approved will be safe and effective if there is a political motive in getting a vaccine out in, you know, before the end of the year? I think the politicalization of this has been really one of the sorrier stories of this pandemic. And again, another missed opportunity. Instead of rallying around our scientists and our thought leaders in the medical community, I think, again, uh, we've seen the administration use this as sort of a flag to say, look, we're going to be successful. And, it, and it's become even an election uh, campaign issue. And I think that's really unfortunate. It should be divorced from that. What we should be doing is rallying around the science, let the science take its place. Again, I will say the research is being done rigorously. I think the issue is the interpretation of the data. And I do share concerns about the data being looked at early maybe early before there's enough conclusive evidence about its effectiveness. I think we'll get a lot of safety data. I, I'm not too worried about that. But I do feel that to really determine if this is going to be effective, we have to wait longer. Look, I'm gonna put you know, my money where my mouth is. I'm gonna sign up for a vaccine study. You know, I can't be in the vaccine study here at UNC because I'm an investigator. But when Duke opens up their vaccine study, I will roll up my sleeve and I will get vaccinated. I don't know what else I could do to convince somebody that it's safe to be in this, reasonably safe, it's a clinical trial, so we know that there's always gonna be risks involved with any therapeutic that you may receive, but that's the usual type of risk that we take when we go into these types of, of research studies. So I'm gonna roll up my sleeve, and that's the only way I can try to indicate physically, if you will, not just with my words, but with my feet, that I think that this is important for us to do. Great, thank you so much. Um, we've got about five more minutes, so please just jump in with your questions. It's Ann Blythe at North Carolina Health News. Um, can you talk a little bit about the two month, uh, like following the vaccine patients for two months, the recent FDA uh, guidelines and that kind of thing? Yeah, there's been a lot of back and forth about these FDA guidelines and I have to be honest with you, I haven't read them. Um, because again, I think there's been some politicalization and some censoring, although I believe the FDA was able to put forth some of the language that before was being withheld from the White House. Look, we have really well-designed clinical trials, the Moderna trial, the Novavax trial, the AstraZeneca trial, they're going to go on for two years. Um, so we're going to have lots of data. So I think what we want to see is that there's some um, milestones built into these analyses that allow us to understand after sufficient time has passed and a sufficient number of people have been followed, whether or not we see a decrease in the number of cases of COVID-19 
with administration of the vaccine compared to placebo. That's really putting you know, feet to the fire. That's what we want to see. We could look at surrogate markers like antibody development. That's important. But really what I think the American people want to know is will this prevent me from getting infected? And again, let's be clear. We all want to get back to normal. If we have an effective and safe vaccine tomorrow, we still might not be back to normal. So it's not a panacea. First of all, the FDA has made it clear that a vaccine has to be at least 50% effective to get approval. If, even if a vaccine is 60 or 70% effective, that means 30% of people who get the vaccine and get exposed sufficiently to the virus could become infected. So it's not perfect and, it's, and no vaccine is perfect but it could be very helpful. That's again, why we need therapeutics, why we need treatments, because not everyone's gonna get the vaccine. Some people don't want it. And even people who do get the vaccine may not be completely in a coat of armor, you know, not going to get infected. So again, we want to have a safety net for them and we need a therapeutic that's safe and effective that can prevent people from getting sicker if they do get infected. Can I ask a follow-up? Can you talk a little bit about the um, steroid that Trump is receiving and what you've seen in your own patients when they, it, it seems like he's in a hyper stage right now. And so what are you going to see like in two or three days? Is he going to drop off or something like that? Um, yeah, you know, uh, corticosteroids like prednisone and dexamethasone, so those are part of the same family. If any of you have had poison ivy and gotten a, a dose pack of prednisone, you know what it's like to be on these medications. They can make you hyper. I, I, I won't read into the actions of the president to tell whether or not this is a side effect of a medication, but I will say that in general, we see people on dexamethasone feel better. Um, I'm not too surprised that someone would say, I haven't felt this well in 20 years. Once you get on some of these corticosteroids, they do make you feel good sometimes. Um, and I think that they are incredibly important. I, I think the doctors who were taking care of President Trump made a good decision. It does signal that he was getting pretty sick. Um, you don't use dexamethasone unless you have to, given its side effects. So I agree with you that um, dexamethasone can have effects on different people in different ways. Um, I can't tell you how it's going to affect any one person. Um, but I think it's been, it's been clear that it's been very effective in this president so far with everything else that he's gotten. Great. We have a couple more minutes. Uh, so please, if you've got any questions, uh, now it's time to jump in and ask Dr. Wall. Uh, just a quick follow-up if I could about flu season. Um, yeah, oh, sorry. I, I forgot to ask. No, no. that's okay. I, uh, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think, I think you're raising a really important point to this, this twin infection or twindemic. Flu is important. We've seen data from other parts of the world, the Southern Hemisphere, that their flu outbreak um, season has been somewhat attenuated, probably, of course, by the social distancing, the mask wearing, the hand washing. So, so you know, if, we, if we believe it works for flu, why wouldn't we believe it works for coronavirus? So we know that this is already attenuating the flu outbreak in the southern part of the, of the world, saving countless lives. So again, I think this is gonna be a really big concern. The problem for us is with scarce resources or stretched resources, how do we test everyone who has a symptom that could be flu or coronavirus infection? And it's gonna be very hard to tease that apart, right? So what we're looking at, and we have meetings going on today and for the rest of the week and for weeks to come, What's our best strategy given the resources that are available? Because everyone's in the same boat and there's not an infinite number of flu tests, just like there isn't an infinite number of COVID-19 tests. So we're gonna have to really think hard. Remember, the, the difference of course between flu and COVID-19 is we do have therapeutics for outpatients for flu. If you're within three days or so, or two days according to the package inserts for flu, um, oseltamivir and biloxivir are two medicines we can give you that cut down the duration of your symptoms. And there's some data that they may help you prevent getting hospitalized. In, in sicker people or people who have higher risk for bad outcomes, these medications may be life-saving. So it's really important for us to prioritize people who could get very sick from the flu, make sure they get tested along with COVID-19, as well as those who are very early in their course. So someone who has had seven, eight days of symptoms, who's younger, doesn't have comorbid conditions that would indicate they're at risk for complications from flu, the value of a flu test for them may not be as great as you can imagine as somebody who's older, 
who has uh, emphysema and who may be at risk for having a really bad outcome with influenza. So everyone's going to be in the same boat wheel. It's going to be all over the state, all over the country. We're going to have to make some decisions about when we bundle flu testing with COVID testing. I have one last question. You know, the president spent just the weekend in the hospital and now he's back in the White House. I think it might have some people thinking, okay, well, this isn't that bad. You know, now he's feeling good. He's back in the White House, he's back to work. What is your message for people who, who see what happened over the weekend and think this might not be as bad as I thought it was? Yeah. So I think this is really important. It gets back to this whole question of, of domination. The, the president got an extraordinary kitchen sink of, of therapeutics, and we don't know which ones worked or if they worked completely, but we do know that a, a kitchen sink approach was taken to this and that he was very sick. You know, anyone who's doubting that this is real, um, you know, we should think about how do we get you into our ICUs to see people hooked up to breathing machines? Um, how do we show you people who, um, care is being withdrawn because there's nothing else to do and then they die. There's lots of people in this country, of course, many who don't have very strong um, opportunities to share their voice, who've lost family members. So, you know, the president didn't dominate COVID-19. If anything, it was the cocktail of drugs he received and maybe some good fortune that let him walk out of Walter Reed. I mean, to suggest that he has special powers that allowed him to dominate the virus, as I've said, you know, it mocks the battle that so many people have fought and lost to COVID-19. Um, you know, so, you know, remdesivir is a medication that was studied in 2015 to treat Ebola. And at the time, citizen Trump, you know, mocked people who went to West Africa saying that whoever did that and came back with Ebola asked for it. Um, so those were the frontline responders then that he was, um, you know, uh, minimizing their, their bravery and their efforts and now is praising the frontline workers who helped save his life. Um, so I, I think, again, this is very serious. If anything, I think most Americans watching what's gone on saw how serious this was and the extraordinary measures that have been taken to protect this president from a virus that unfortunately a lot of other people were not protected against. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Wall. Uh, we are over time, it's 10.33. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we have done the recording of the audio and the um, video, and we'll post them on Dropbox um, within the next 20 minutes or so, and those will be unedited, so you can use those knowing that they're exactly what was uh, said here in the meeting. So thank you again for joining us, and we will talk to you next Thanks, time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Wall. Bye-bye.